This lecture is specific to conceptual physics AB. This has to do with one of the details that we skipped over when talking about explosions and collisions. When talking about explosions and collisions, we basically examine what happened before the process and then what happened after the process. We didn't, however, go over what happened during the process. For example, picture these two carts here undergoing an elastic collision. For example, say, like so. While the carts are colliding together, they are exerting internal forces upon one another. Ultimately, those internal forces don't matter when describing the momentum of the system prior to the collision and the momentum of the system after the collision, but now we're interested in understanding the details of those internal forces. The internal forces that occur as one cart exerts a force on another obeys a very characteristic type of graph. You can begin to understand the graph that I'm about to construct by picturing these elastic bands. So for example, at the point of first contact, very rapidly the force that one cart exerts upon another increases. It increases rapidly up to a maximum value when the, the elastic bands are as compressed as they're going to be. And then just as rapidly it decreases back down to zero as the carts separate from each other from the point of last contact. Usually this process is very quick. In the case of these carts, they are literally only colliding together for a few hundredths or a few thousandths of a second. Usually you're never gonna notice the compression itself unless you use, for example, what is called high-speed photography. High-speed photography is done by taking many frames of photographs per second, thereby taking very fast physical processes and enabling you to slow them down such that you can examine them. So in the case of objects, when they collide, they may very much behave like these elastic bands, which compress as these carts collide together. This actually also occurs between, for example, very seemingly rigid objects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to redirect my phone here such you can see a photograph that I have on my screen of what happens when a baseball bat and a baseball come in contact with one another. If you photograph the collision by using high-speed photography, you could actually see that both of the objects are noticeably deformed. In other words, the baseball bat and the baseball are compressed. So let me go ahead and point my camera, like so, towards my screen, like this. I'll zoom in a little bit. So, and then if you look at the photograph here carefully, you could see very noticeably that the baseball is deformed. It's compressed up against the bat. The bat is also compressed. So even seemingly very rigid objects undergo this compression, much like the elastic bands on my carts when the collision occurs. There is a graph that is used to describe this collision. Let me now take you through those details. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom back out like so. Let's go ahead and redirect, like so. Okay. Okay. All right, so the graph that we use to describe the internal forces that one card exerts upon another is a graph of force as a function of time. So let's examine a collision. And then before the collision, we would have examined the situation in the following manner. We would have said, okay, here's cart number one with its initial velocity. Here's cart number two with its initial velocity. And then after the collision, we have cart number one rebounding with a final velocity. Here's cart number two rebounding with a final velocity. Okay, we did a specific example of a one-dimensional elastic collision, if you recall, involving pool balls. However, what actually happens during the collision? Well, that's now what we're going to examine. Okay, so during the collision, here's M1 and here's M2, and they exert forces upon one another, an equal and opposite reaction pair from Newton's third law. So for example, Right here is the force on two due to one. And then right here is the force on one due to two. And then we examine one of these forces. It doesn't matter which one we examine. And now what I'm gonna do here on the lower board, 
is describe the grant that I've mentioned. Plot one of those forces, it doesn't matter which, as a function of time. And then if you look at the elastic bands here on these carts once again, very rapidly, as I said, the force goes from a value of zero at the point of first contact to a maximum value when these elastic bands are as compressed as they're going to be. And then just as rapidly, it shoots back down to zero once again at the point of last contact. That then produces a very characteristic graph that looks like this. Like so this spike, as it's sometimes nicknamed, as. So right here is the point of first contact. Right here is the point of last contact. And the total amount of time over which the collision occurs is usually a few hundredths or a few thousandths of a second when you're talking about rigid objects, much like, for example, what happens when the baseball and the baseball bat collide. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to approximate this spike here as a rectangle. This will allow us to get around some calculus, of course, as always, that we skip in this class. So then here's how we'll do this as an approximation. Okay, so as an approximation, we'll take that spike from just a few moments ago and approximate it as a rectangle, like this, okay? That's not a very good rectangle. Let me draw another one. Make it look a little bit more even. There we go, that's a little bit better. Okay, now right here is the height of the rectangle. The height of the rectangle is actually the average force that one cart exerts upon another. And then right here is the width of the rectangle. The width of the rectangle here is the time interval. It's just referred to as delta t. Once again, it's usually a few hundredths or a few thousandths of a second, and it's measured by using high-speed photography. Okay, now mathematically. Mathematically, we describe this graph by using Newton's second law. Now recall that Newton's second law is F equals ma, where the acceleration is change in velocity with respect to time. However, notice what the numerator is of this expression when I write it in this manner. Mass multiplied by change in velocity, which is change in momentum. This then means that there is an alternate means of writing Newton's second law, and this is actually the most general way of writing Newton's second law. F equals change in momentum with respect to time. This is how Newton himself originally wrote the law in Principia when he published it in 1687. Basically, you could read now Newton's second law in the following way. The sum of the forces acting on an object results in a change in the momentum of the object with respect to time. This is the most general way of describing Newton's second law because it takes into account any possible situation involving a system of objects, involving objects that are losing mass over time, such as rockets and so on and so forth. Okay, now how does this form of Newton's second law relate to this graph? Well, what I'm going to do is take the time, delta t, and just move it over here to the left-hand side, such that the expression looks like this. Like so. And now, take a look at this over here on the left-hand side, force multiplied by time. That's actually the area of this rectangle. The force in this case is the average amount of force that one card exerts upon another. So to be a little bit more precise about that, I'll go ahead and write this as an average. But if you take force and multiply it by time, you're basically taking the height of this rectangle and multiplying it by its base. That's the area of this rectangle. We give this quantity here a name. This is referred to as impulse. And it's always referred to as the letter J. The reason why we bother to define this quantity is twofold. Number one, it's a mathematical description of this graph, the mathematical behavior of what happens as these carts collide together like so. And then secondly, it's really easy to measure. The reason why it's easy to measure is because the impulse itself is nothing more than being equal to the change in the momentum of one of the carts. That's why we bother to define it, because it's easy to measure. The hard thing to measure in all this is the time interval delta t. As I said, realistically, the only way to measure the time interval over which this collision occurs is by photographing it by using high-speed photography. So the impulse is the easy thing to calculate. 
If you can then measure the time interval, then yes, you can calculate the force that one card exerts upon another, but in order to be able to do so, you have to use high-speed photography. Now we're just going to take a look at one example involving a baseball bat colliding with a baseball as an example problem. All that we're doing here is a brief look at impulse. That follows in part two of this lecture.